This is continuing coverage in the trial of Richard Merritt from the Hidden Killers podcast on the True Crime Today Network. Right. Mr. Queen, has your client made a decision about whether or not he's going to testify? He has all. All right, Mr. Merritt, if you'll please stand. Mr. Merritt, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions on the record, and I need to make sure that you keep your voice up so that the court reporter can take down your responses. Yes, Do you understand that you have a right to testify, and if you want to testify, then no one can prevent you from doing so? Do you understand that no one can make or compel you to testify? That is, do you understand that you have a right to not testify if you do not want to? Do you understand that not your lawyer, but you personally are the one who decides whether you will testify or not? Do you understand if you do not testify, then upon proper request by you, the court will instruct the jury that your decision cannot be used against you? Do you understand if you choose to testify, you will both be examined by your counsel and cross-examined by the assistant DA? Do you personally want to testify or not? I find the defendant has decided to testify with a complete understanding of his rights. You bring the jury in. Excuse me, Robert. Yes. Uh, let's see, two matters. One, I'm not sure is the court going to put some merit on the stand. It is on the, with the leg angle. Do you intend to call him first? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Let me move them or put them on stand at a time. I have no problems. I think we should go ahead and let him be on the stand when the jury comes in. Uh, second matter, Your Honor. Um, the first business which the state, or excuse me, the defense will be putting forth is offensive number two, which is a certified copy of the arrest warrant in this case. Uh, a measure for. I'm sorry, it's the what? The Okay. The rest of them, sir. Okay. That's the first matter. And Your Honor, I anticipate going to the course of Mr. Mayor's testimony. We will be seeking to present a four page document, which is a letter accompanied by some handwritten notes. It's defensive number three. The letter is a letter which was typed up by Mrs. Merrick. Sure, Mayor, and sent to Mr. Merritt's attorney, Mr. David Willingham. The letter was created two days, well, actually one day before the sentencing hearing. But two days before the sentencing hearing, Ms. Merritt was hospitalized. And I think we had some discussion about that. She was having some chest issues, heart issues, she was hospitalized. And then the next day when she was released, she created this letter, and this letter talks about some of the issues regarding the case, some of the issues about the conflict, and the distress it caused her and the family. And then this letter, which was, it's actually in the discovery, is one of the items which CSI Burnett um, testified about documents being by the nightstand in this marriage room. Um, Mr. Mayor, he has actual direct knowledge um, of his mother creating this letter, of his mother expressing concerns to the attorney, Mr. David Willingham. And Your Honor, we believe they are admissible under 24803 as they are present sense impressions when she got out of the hospital and the stress and, and um, agony she was going through. We also believe they express her then existing mental emotional and physical condition. And then finally, Your Honor, we believe that you fall within, if not under 24-8803, they fall under 24-8807, the residual hearsay exception, where there are evidence of material fact that are more close on point, which is often the end of evidence, which the opponent can procure for reasonable efforts. The judge, if the state has an issue with it, I think we need to resolve that issue now, um, prior to Mr. Mayor's testimony. Can I see the exhibit? Yes, Your Honor.
So, uh, Mr. Queen, you indicate this is a four-page exhibit, but it looks like the letter from um, Mrs. Merritt is only the first two pages. And the last two pages, in addition to the bottom of the second page, appears to be handwriting. So, is this how the letter was received by the attorney? The, the, the attorney received the first two pages. Uh -huh. It appears that the document which was left by the bank is actually the four pages. So whose handwriting is this? That is Mrs. Mayor's handwriting. And somebody's going to be able to identify that as her handwriting? Mr. Mayor, yes. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. All right. First, uh, let me just get the residual hearsay exception out of the way. Um, 248807 requires that a proponent offers sufficient notice of their intent to use that item under this hearsay exception. Um, it says that a statement may not be admitted under this code section unless the proponent of it makes known to the adverse party sufficiently in advance of the trial or hearing to provide the adverse party with a fair opportunity to prepare to meet it. The proponent's intention to offer the statement and the particulars of it, including the name and address of the declarant. We have not had any kind of advance notice. This is the first that we've heard that they do intend to use it. We've always considered this to be hearsay of um, Mrs. Merritt that does not fall under any, uh, any exception. As to uh, present sense impression, Your Honor, that a present sense of impression is something like when somebody calls 911 and they're talking about the impressions that they have at the time that they are seeing them. That's not the case in this letter here. She talks about something that happened in the past and she actually says, I felt nauseated, dizzy, and nearly fainted. Again, that's clear that she is not speaking in the present sense but rather of what had happened in the past. Um, additionally, this is full of hearsay. Um, she's talking about what Janine allegedly had said to her in the past, um, and she's describing events, describing events that occurred in the days preceding her writing this letter. Um, again, there's no guarantees of trustworthiness. There's there's no, as to the letter, um, I, I'm not sure how they intend to um, admit this and authenticate it, but it's a typewritten letter. Nobody can testify as to whether Mrs. Merritt wrote it or it was found in the house, but it could have just as easily been written by the defendant. And so there's no way to authenticate it. Um, I know that David Willingham, the defendant's previous attorney in Cobb County was under subpoena, but I believe he was told not to come this morning by the defense. So I, I don't think that they'll be able to authenticate this through him either. Um, I, I just think that there's issues all around with this letter, and I don't think that it falls under any of the hearsay exceptions. So I'd ask that it not be admitted. Well, the residual exception would only apply if the court doesn't find that it falls one underneath one of the other exceptions to hearsay. Um, Mr. Queen, as far as 803 goes, Explain to me how this is an excited utterance. So I'm not saying it's excited. I'm just saying the present sense impression. 803 um, one. Okay. How, how is this a present sense impression then? Because 
The statute says that the statement describing or explaining an event or condition made while the declarant was perceiving the event or condition or immediately thereafter. Okay, this but the, 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 the very first line of this is, I'm very upset over the turn of events this week. It, it, it doesn't give an indication of the time period within which she is allegedly writing this letter or when the flyer in the mailbox was received. So how does this indicate that this was prepared while the declarant was still under the stress of the situation? The letter was dated January 17th. I understand. Um, she was hospitalized on the 16th, but we already heard from Ms. Metacosi that a couple of days prior to the sentencing, which the record shows on the 18th, is when the cartoon was sent. And Ms. Metacosi testified that she did speak to Ms. Romero regarding the contents of the cartoon, which puts us the 16th, 17th. And here we have um, Ms. Merrick describes in the letter here that this the cartoon which prior her she believes having concerns and physical palpitations that cause her to pop a lot in the system. And the judge just jump back for a moment um, as to notice this is the state's evidence. Um, the state has the originals in their file. Um, to the state. Well, well, evidence is evidence. It doesn't necessarily belong to either party. It's it's evidence in the case, regardless right. of, of but this, but who not, has it. So correct. it's not the state's evidence. It's evidence in the case. I, I but agree. but again, the exception, the rule says a statement describing or explaining an event or condition made while the declarant was perceiving the event or condition or immediately thereafter. So again, unless someone is able is going to be able to testify as to when exactly Ms. Merritt received the cartoon related to when she wrote this letter, I don't see how this qualifies under that exception. Again, Your Honor, Ms. Merritt can testify as the date which they received the cartoon. They're living in the same house. The date they received the cartoon. Which would be what date? That's on the 16th. 14th. Let him see on the 14th. Uh-huh. Mother's hospitalized on the 16th. Uh-huh. And, and then she says she has a letter that she sent on the 17th. Okay. So the 17th is three days after the cartoon was received and at least the day after she was released from the hospital. Day before she was hospitalized. She was released cartoon, on the 18th. Cartoon. Then we have... We have, cart we have cartoon on the 14th, we have hospitalization on the 16th, release on the 17th, sentence on the 18th. So she writes this letter on the 17th and it's sent on the 18th. It's sent or received on the 18th. The hearing on the 18th. Mm -hmm. um, and she sends it, I believe, on the 17th or 18th. Listen. Okay. Leave on the 17th, Judge. Well, it's written on the 17th. And then set up on the 17th. Okay. Which is three days after the cartoons received. And is it the same day yeah, she's released? Day after she's released? Okay, yeah, that's what I said earlier. Right. So day a day she's after she's released from the hospital. On the 15th, she's on the 16th, sent letter on the 17th. Okay. You're listening to The Trial of Richard Merritt from the Hidden Killers podcast on the True Crime Today Network. Press subscribe now and get ad-free episodes by upgrading to our premium experience through Apple Podcasts. Lure. Next.